thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I stand up here today as a practice guide panel member. I had the pleasure of working on the guide under and with a number of other folks who are here in the room, and certainly um, Russell Gersten was instrumental in that report. I um, should tell you that my background is really in special education, um, and about, I guess, more than 12 years ago, I was in the Vancouver public schools, uh, had just had finished my master's and uh, was doing a lot of work in the schools around uh, in school psychology and special education in that district. They're merged as one. And most of the questions that we had were about English learners. And uh, we had at the time in Vancouver by the mid to late 90s about 33 native languages in the district. Most of the questions coming from the field were obviously uh, focused on this population. Is this a reading difficulty? Is this second language learning? Do we wait and see? Do we do something right away? And we had very few answers to those questions. And I think in my master's program, at least, maybe one class of each course had sort of focused on this topic of cultural and linguistic diversity, and that was about it. And also, here in the US, of course, there had been this body of research that said, that asked the question, should they be taught in their native language or in English? And it didn't inform questions we necessarily had about the type of teaching, the quality of the teaching, the characteristics. Uh, and when you have a district with 35 native languages, you're less concerned with which language and more concerned with how to do this. So um, all of that took me to my doctoral work and um, continued collaboration with the district to think about how reading develops for English learners and how we might approach uh, designing classroom-based instruction for them, particularly in the domain of early reading and it, sort of early identification and intervention. I've been at the Harvard Graduate School of Education about 11 years now. Um, I do a lot of my work in partnership with large urban districts, less focused on the individual reader and more focused on uh, thinking about the design of quality classroom-based instruction, which is to say, with the growth of this population, it's a little less about you know, which child and, and what their profile is, and more about how do we rethink the way that we approach instruction in these linguistically diverse settings, whether students are classified as limited English proficient or reclassified, we see lots of language learning opportunities and needs. Um, so my work is mostly in partnership with districts to think about promoting and preventing uh, reading difficulties. And so um, the chance to do this work on the practice guide was excellent. And what I thought I'd do this morning is say a few things about the way in which this guide sort of expands and builds upon the first guide, which came out in 2007, and how it may differ slightly, and then introduce to you the first three recommendations, and then I will turn it over to Russell Gersten, who will talk about the fourth. But I want to acknowledge the panelists first on this slide here. Scott Baker was the chair of the panel. Uh, Esther Gava was a panelist. Michael Kiefer from New York University. Sylvia Lena and Thompson here from the UT Austin. Joan Morris, who's here with us today, and we'll talk more about the guide. Patrick Proc Proctor, a colleague and friend of mine at Boston College and Randy Russell from the Miami-Dade Public Schools. It was an excellent group to work with, and you'll see that their sort of diverse professional experiences and opinion kind of reflect, reflected in the guide. So how is the guide in 2014 different, and how does it build upon the one in 2007? Well, the research that informed the guide in 2007 uh, was conducted up until 2005, and between 2005 and 2012, you can imagine there's just been a, an explosion of research in the area and just much more advancement for what we know about teaching English learners. So for starters, we have just seven more years of work and knowledge to build on. The first guide, not surprisingly, given the science at the time and the policy at the time, was really focused on beginning reading, how to think about teaching beginning reading for English learners, which was remarkably important and um, very timely. There was some discussion of vocabulary and peer-assisted learning. They were recommendations on their own. Now, the vocabulary and language work and the peer-assisted learning uh, 
is infused throughout the recommendations, and I'll say more about that in a minute. At the time, there was mention in the Guide of Academic Language uh, and that as a concept and a construct that there was little research at the time. There was certainly a collective expertise in the room of panelists for the 2007 guide that said this thing called academic language is really important. There's very little empirical work to draw on at that time. Since then, there's much more. I should say it's mostly in the domain of academic vocabulary, which would be a subcomponent of academic language. But we have things to say in the guide about academic language overall. I think probably the largest difference then, if we think about the 2007 guide as really being about informing beginning reading, is this guide goes from elementary through the middle school years. It's a K-8 approach to thinking about supporting English language learners. And the other key difference is that we as a panel decided to both focus on those English learners who were classified as such, whether it's limited English proficient or some other name, and those who were reclassified, knowing what we know, that a student may be considered quote unquote proficient at second grade, reclassified, and struggle at fifth or sixth grade, we didn't want to make that distinction. There's language learning and literacy needs that continue through early adolescence. And so this guide does not make that distinction. Um, You'll see that one of the recommendations, the first one is expressly focused on academic vocabulary. And that notion runs through the guide. So does academic language. And there is a recommendation expressly focused on writing, even though we didn't have as much research as we would like. We had enough collective expertise and data to suggest we really need to push not just on the development of oral language, but also on the development of written language, if we think about academic language and the curriculum overall. You'll see some cross-cutting th themes through the guide. And I should say that um, I mentioned that language development and peer-assisted learning are those that cut through and across the recommendations. I should also say that we didn't take a stand on any one given program or setting, that the idea here is that the recommendations ought to inform and be helpful uh, under different settings and circumstances and program types. Um, and so in that sense, it's a real continuation and expansion of the earlier guide and reflects the continued changing demographics and this notion of language learning and literacy learning needs right up through the adolescent years. High school, we took secondary school as a different terrain altogether. So this guide stops at middle school. So that gives you some context for the work and our thinking. What I thought I would do this morning um, is introduce to you the first three recommendations. Uh, you'll see that the first one is focused on academic vocabulary, the second on how we think about integrating oral and written language instruction into content area teaching, and the third is about um, developing writing skills. Then I'm going to turn it over to Russell, who's going to talk about the fourth recommendation, which is probably builds the most closely off the first guide around a small group intervention to students struggling in areas of literacy and English language development, so more targeted, thinking about targeted supports. Um, what I thought I would do to introduce the first three recommendations is first just ensure we're all on the same page about the population and some of the pressing issues with respect to their literacy development, and then I will move through each of the first three recommendations. I think as I move through the recommendations, I would welcome questions and or I, can, I will certainly stop with lots of time for a general Q&A overall. So um, today's 21st century landscape, particularly here in the US, which is the context of the guide, we remind ourselves that Spanish continues to be the, the majority language within this population, but that we have at least 440 other languages, so at any given time, we're not usually just thinking about one native language, but at least several. And certainly, the linguistic diversity within the population is at a place where we're less inclined to talk about majority, minority, and more inclined to just talk about an increasingly diverse uh, nation. We know that the projections by the demographers suggest that this group is only going to grow uh, exponentially over time, for example, uh, about 82% of the population 
growth will be due to immigration by 2060. We're looking at about 67 million in the country. 47 million will be their children and 3 million will be their grandchildren. We uh, also remind ourselves, particularly as we wrote this guide, that um, our largest and fastest growing group within this population are U.S. born children. It does not make them native English speakers, but they are up through our system. So while there can be the prevailing myth that this is all about adolescents and newcomers and how do we quickly develop language uh, that gets them uh, up to speed for a secondary curriculum. In fact, the group we're the most worried about because of its size and because of their outcomes are those children who indeed enroll in our early education and care settings and go up through the system, and yet whose uh, <clears throat> academic outcomes don't, in fact, look any better than those who may have entered later. So we think a lot about that group and ensure that we're in our conversations, we're making the distinction between the smaller group of adolescent newcomers and the larger group of school-aged children who are up through the system. Here in the US, we um, not surprisingly cannot disentangle necessarily the, the uh, issue of linguistic diversity with that of growing up in poverty, which has implications, of course, for the settings, the school-based settings and the resources, and also some individual level factors such as some of the stressors that come with growing up in poverty. Um, and cert but certainly, we know that poverty and linguistic diversity at this point in time are correlated with limited opportunities to develop the advanced literacy skills. And I signal advanced because, in fact, we're at a place where what it means to be literate is on the incline. What it takes to be literate in society has increased over the last several decades. And it's not the case that students' skills are necessarily on the decline. It's, it's just that our demand for what it means to be literate is on the incline. We see very high rates of special education placement among English learners. So for example, in some of the latest research that we've done, both in my group and in other um, national centers, it's about a three to one ratio. English learners placed in special education compared to non-English learners. Special education was not at all designed for any one demographic population. It was designed for a much smaller group of students who have constitutional, individual level difficulties uh, with um, language learning, et cetera. And finally, not surprisingly then, we worry about high dropout rates among this population that if one cannot access and thrive independently within the curriculum, obviously it's hard to persist in school. So on the poverty linguistic diversity side of things, we a case example is that currently one in three Latino children grow up in poverty. So if we have Spanish as our primary and majority language within this population, it's heavily confounded then with growing up in a household um, that qualifies as low income. We worry less about the household, but we worry more about the language and learning opportunities in the school and the community that track closely with poverty. The NAEP scores, we've all seen them. You've seen them in the state and you've seen them other places, but certainly we have persistent opportunity gaps to think about um, that are relatively fixed, not particularly changing. 36 point gap at fourth grade, about a 44 point gap at eighth grade. Not surprisingly, we see more of a gap as students age. So that's sort of the landscape, the backdrop. Um, doesn't suggest there aren't real strengths among this population. We're just looking at the data on average. We remind ourselves also that under many circumstances, bilingualism ought to be a cognitive advantage. We see that at the level of the individual. They can work with the sounds of the language more easily. They are more cognitively flexible on a number of tasks. But at scale, when we look at the way in which they are doing as a population within the educational system, they are more at risk than they are on the other side. So the other, uh, the other sort of backdrop information that I thought would be helpful that certainly came into our um, discussions and our reading of the evidence as a panel was really just what it is that we've learned about literacy development among English learners, again, at scale, thinking overall on average with the group. Um, the first distinction then that we make in this work 
And in our discussions about this population and the instruction that we offer them is really a distinction between it sort of with respect to two domains of reading. So if we take this fifth grade passage about high-speed trains, we can first identify a number of word level skills that students need in order to read this passage. We know that they need some word family, some knowledge about word families. We know that they need to be able to decode the sounds in, in a word, identify those sounds, put it back together, read that word. We know they need to do that with sufficient accuracy and automaticity. For example, at the fifth grade, they need to do this at 115 plus words correct per minute in order to then have the space, cognitive sort of space and mental energy left over to actually make meaning from print. And as they make meaning from print, they're going to draw on their vocabulary knowledge, some cognitive strategies. They're going to need some relevant background knowledge. You need something. You need to know something about trains to even stand a shot at comprehension here. You'd need to have the interest and the motivation. So if we were going to be blunt, given uh, for the purposes of thinking about reading as an, act, an act, we're going to call out two different problem spaces, that we have the code-based skills on the one hand, the letter, word, sounds, the, the um, more mechanical side of reading, and we have the meaning-based skills on the other. So broadly, we want to think, especially when we're thinking about this population, that in every reader, we're trying to develop at least two sides of the same coin, right? We've got the code-based skills and the meaning-based skills. And both are crucial and necessary for effective comprehension. So we think about code-based skills as sort of the platform by which to even access the print and the meaning-based skills to really operate on the print and get some kind of story from that text. Does that make sense to folks? And over time, we remind ourselves that on the meaning language-based side, things change and the game changes, that the curriculum becomes more language-heavy, more complex with respect to text than it does over the years. And that has real implications for our English learners, that reading in first grade is not the same as reading in 10th grade, even though you may have mastered your code-based skills, your meaning-based skills need to keep pace with what it means to be literate. The finding that a number of us focused on in thinking about and looking at the evidence, and not surprisingly, much of the intervention work in the upper elementary and middle school years over the last decade or so, has focused on trying to address the issue of developing both the code-based skills and the meaning-based skills among this population. And if we look at this graph here, and I'm sorry that the first line is too light, but what you'll see if you can, let me see if I have a clicker here, maybe not. What, what you can't <laughs> see, although maybe some of you can, maybe your handout, oh no, you don't have the slides in a handout. What we're getting, if you look at the arrow on, uh, on the far right at age 14, if we, when we followed this sample, just in the, as an example, when we followed this sample of English learners from age 4.5 to age 14, that's a 10-year study, US-born children from Spanish-speaking households, what we get over time is a real gap between their word reading skills and their word knowledge skills, which is to say many of them, on average, this group cracks the code under the right instru instructional circumstances, appropriate uh, levels of uh, word reading skills by the time they enter high school. In this case, their vocabulary knowledge hovered around the 20th percentile generally across schooling years. And what happens is over time, we don't get the purchase on the code-based skills mapping onto comprehension because what's getting in the way of using those code-based skills really well is having the vocabulary to make meaning from the print. So the answer here is not to say that we're doing too much code-based teaching. It's not that at all. They need to be, so they need to be entirely uh, proficient 
at decoding accurate and fluent, they need to master the 26 letters, 44 sound kind of combination. But we need to become much more intentional, explicit, and intensive on the meaning-based side if we're going to catch them up over time. What I want to be clear about, you may not be able to see this very well either, but what's really interesting about these longitudinal studies, which have really just been released in the last few years, is that the rates of growth for this population look very good in both vocabulary and word reading which is to say this is not a learning problem. They are learning, in fact, more words than their peers are each and every day over time. The problem is they need to learn even more. So think about your to-do list. I think about this. I'm getting a lot done every day. I'm knocking things off. I'm moving. I'm learning. I'm doing my job. But Monday to Friday, things get added to the list. I'm still not as far as I'd like to be on Friday. And then it's the next Monday. And then it's the next Friday. And I'm working. But the treadmill isn't going fast enough, right? So what we're concerned about is taking those learning rates and rates of growth and saying, this is a thriving, smart population. Struggling readers are not struggling thinkers. How do we both teach the code and dial up what it is we're doing to teach meaning. Does that make sense to folks? And let's find the opportunity so that we don't have code teaching over here and comprehension and vocabulary teaching over here, but there's some content-based approach that connects the two. Because what we get with the vocabulary knowledge at the 20th percentile turns out to be a knowledge gap overall, which is that they need more academic knowledge to access the curriculum, period. That's world knowledge, background knowledge, however you want to think about it. Vocabulary is just a proxy. We see we have a set, similar study on the West Coast that replicates this finding entirely. There are a few other longitudinal studies that suggest the same thing. Again, we're not looking for the baby out with the bathwater on code-based teaching. We absolutely need to do that, or they certainly won't access print. But it's necessary but not sufficient. It's not going to get us to where we need to go. So here we get, with, an eighth, with sample we studied from fourth to eighth grade, we follow them. We get decoding rates by the eighth grade around the 65th percentile. We still have expressive vocabulary levels around the 15th percentile. This is another sample up through the system, in this case in the San Diego Unified, mostly US-born children of Mexican immigrants. And what happens is, on the far right, your comprehension, their comprehension will rarely exceed their vocabulary knowledge. Because if you can't access the concepts on the page, you're not going to be able to make sense of the text. Does that make sense to folks? So that's some background that we've been thinking about and we grapple with. And we all collectively, as we think about serving this population, want to keep, and particularly those of you who do a lot of professional development work in your schools, in your districts, et cetera, I want to keep pushing on this idea that when we do assessment and instruction and intervention, we think about which element, at least big bucket of reading, we're thinking about. Does that make sense to folks? And I think one uh, thing we ought to think, to think about is it really does have implications for how we assess early literacy development. Because in many cases, if we're only, if we're only capturing the code-based side of reading until that third or fourth grade test rolls around, then what happens is that third or fourth grade test is a surprise because many of them may be accurate and fluent at the word level. So um, that's some of the backdrop for and some of the developmental data that informs the recommendations one through three that I'm going to talk about now. Um, and the first is you'll see, um, and actually I'd invite you to to follow along with this handout that was in your folder, we've operationalized these recommendations using a piece of text and, an, and some ideas so that we can sort of concretize what it is that we're talking about. It's not always easy to push on this idea of content-based literacy instruction. Like, what are we really talking about? What about word choice when we're talking about academic vocabulary, et cetera? So I'd invite you to pull this page out, and we'll I'll spend a few minutes walking through um, recommendations one through three, 
<clears throat> OK, so the first recommendation, not surprisingly, had, the most, uh, had a very strong level of evidence, builds very nicely off uh, the last few decades of research, and focuses expressly on teaching academic vocabulary words intensively across several days using a variety of instructional activities. So um, this, this recommendation is based on six studies that met the criteria for this work. Um, the studies span pre-K through eighth grade. And I should say that the studies were conducted, and this is the case for all three recommendations that I'm going to talk about. The studies are conducted in classrooms with English learners and native English speakers. So these tend to be high, highly diverse, often low-income urban settings where the students are in mainstream classrooms together. And that sort of feeds into this idea that we're not necessarily making a, a very significant distinction between those who are classified and those who are reclassified, but instead students whose home language primarily is one other than English in the Northeast. Yeah. So back to the practice guide. Um, the first recommendation is about academic vocabulary. The, um, the application of this first one is pre-K to 8. And we remind ourselves that the, the, this is based on work that was uh, conducted in classrooms uh, often mixed of English learners and their English-only peers. All studies, however, do um, break out their results by English learners and non-English learners, so we can be sure that the results hold for this group uh, primarily. So um, for this first recommendation, you can see that we really break it down into four steps. So the teaching a set of academic words intensively academic vocabulary words intensively across several days is broken out into four steps. The first has to do with text selection. The second is how do we choose which words to teach? The third is about what does word learning instruction look like? Uh, and what do those activities look like uh, fourth? So let me start with text selection and say that the first step to teaching academic vocabulary in based on the evidence and what we know um, is to start with text rather than necessarily starting with a word list, which is, which is a difference. This is a difference for those of you thinking about work in your own schools. Let's start with a piece of text. Why is that? Well, we're going to start with a brief, engaging piece of informational text. It's going to use the academic vocabulary as and, and then the text itself becomes this platform for intensive instruction. Well, why would we start with text? First of all, we remind ourselves it's the language of text that is giving these, these learners the most difficulty. It's not the language of everyday conversation. It's not the directions. It's not the classroom discussion necessarily. It's the text itself. We, as educated adults, don't use nearly the academic vocabulary that even uh, fifth and sixth grade text does, even though we might think that were the case. The second is remind, we remind ourselves that a lot of this is about a knowledge gap. A lot of this is about building up knowledge around the world, of, of the world. And so if we start with informational text that's anchored in some kind of unit of study, then our literacy and language work is content rich, knowledge based. It's meant to add up to concepts over time. So here we use this example of this piece of text about exhibits that are in zoos and the way that they've changed over time. So you could imagine it connecting to a unit of study. Um, there's even the sort of notion of ethical treatment of animals that's inherent in this piece of text. You'd have to think about, we are not necessarily recommending this text. What we are recommending here is starting with brief pieces of text that feature some key academic words that are central to a unit of study that uh, is underway in the classroom. You can see that here we sort of highlighted the six academic words we chose uh, to highlight for potential instruction. I'll say more about that in a minute. But the text contains ideas that can be discussed from a variety of perspectives. Remember that if you're going to study these words and concepts, 
for several days. You need enough meat on the bones, enough fodder to do that, need things to discuss and study over time. Um, and so uh, you can see that um, the detail and the examples sort of support comprehension. We go into more uh, detail in the guide itself. But the step number two that's choosing the words themselves is, not, is probably the most instrumental step, which is how do you decide when you approach a piece of grade level text that you know has all kinds of words that are going to be problematic for your learners, right? We know that in many cases we could highlight 60, 70 percent of words and feel like they're worth teaching. Well, obviously you're going to have to make some decisions. One of the things that's happened over the years is we've tended to want to teach many words to our learners because we're thinking about their running out of time. And what we've learned very clearly from the research is that we're going to have to slow down and do fewer words more deeply. When we do fewer words more deeply, we're also teaching other words around that word because we're necessarily studying the concept. We're not just stopping at, can you spell it? Can you use it in a sentence? And can we move on? That's sort of that stage one shallow vocabulary teaching here, what we're doing is studying a small set of concepts. So you can see that we came up with sort of six dimensions on which we think about how we might analyze the potential words for teaching. Obviously, one is to be, for it to be frequently used in the text. That seems uh, sort of obvious. The second would be that it's central to understanding the text, also obvious. But here's where the next four sort of are food for thought. It might appear in other content areas. That seems particularly important. Remember that we're trying to increase the number of exposures and encounters students have with the words that we're teaching. So if we can leverage science and socials and other, and other content areas, all the better. The fourth dimension is about morphology, which is to say, is there an opportunity here for learning about how words work? And in this case, we list affixes. And four of the words have affixes that are worth studying. The fifth dimension is about multiple meanings and uses. So one of the things that trips up our English language learners and many of their peers is that the meaning that is used in print is often different and a more rare use of the word than when we use it every day in our, in our everyday language. And finally, you'll see that um, the cross-language potential is an important one. Are there ways in which students might make connections back to their native language? Is there a cognate here? Is there a word that may be similar in their native language, which is another opportunity for supporting word uh, knowledge development? This third step is about how we go about this teaching. And so I mentioned that the very straightforward kind of traditional way of teaching vocabulary has really been to either stumble upon a word during a read aloud, call it out, define it, and move on, which we consider actually just incidental comprehension instruction. It's not really vocabulary teaching because it's in the context of that text and you're just calling it out to keep going through the text. That's one way, and the second way has been to start with a word list, study those words, memorize them, spell them, use them in a sentence, and move on. Neither of those approaches are clearly sufficient for the population that we're talking about, which means that we need to go to multiple modalities, the reading, writing, listening, and speaking, when we're studying concepts, academic concepts. And so you'll see that we have a number of recommendations about the way we do this, uh, engaging students in those activities that sort of increase their exposure to and experience with the target words across contexts and over time. So if you think about the studying concepts over time, then what you're thinking about is moving from uh, on, you know, thinking about the listening, speaking, writing piece. Um, you'll see that we have some examples in the guide, but really this is, these examples are just meant as food for thought. The idea here is to kind of get you into a different framework for thinking about how we go about deep vocabulary teaching, which well, runs well past one lesson or even a few lessons and goes across multiple days and probably draws on fewer words than you might be used to teaching. So in this case, um, we remind ourselves that dictionaries are not actually very friendly 
student-friendly places. You don't often learn the concept of word by looking it up in the dictionary if you really didn't know it. It works well for us with well-developed vocabularies to kind of jog our memory about a word or look up its synonym and antonym and sort of get to it. So we do a lot of work with student-friendly definitions. There's a lot more discussion and talk that goes with this so that they can start trying out the concepts. In this case, we give some role play examples that connect to how we might play out a unit of study with this text on zoos. So all of that is sort of instructive. And finally, we always end the cycle and all of the intervention studies that we reviewed connect it into the writing. So we're taking the writing out of the personal and into the informational content. We're taking the writing away from sort of independent and disconnected from the unit of study and anchoring it and connecting it directly to the unit of study. So in this case, the prompt is for students at the end of the unit of study on zoos or ethical treatment of animals or whatever big idea or concept you decide to attach to this as an example. The prompt is about deciding what kind of zoo they think would be better to visit and write, writing a paragraph that explains the choice. They're going to use some of the uh, target words that they've been studying, and they're going to compare and contrast the old versus the new. So you can see that we sort of round out the unit of study with writing. The fourth uh, step is really about the role of morphology in promoting students' reading comprehension skills and their word knowledge, which is to say that we cannot possibly teach students all of the words that they need to learn. 50,000, 60,000, depends on whose research you look at, that they need academic words by the end of high school. We cannot possibly do that directly with the time that we have. What we can do, however, is build, uh, build up our students' word learning abilities, which is to say we know that what a lot of good readers do when they come across a word that they don't know is they are able to analyze its parts. They see if there's a prefix, a suffix. They can look at the root or the base of the word and determine whether they can gain the meaning or glean the meaning there. They can even use often context clues, which has, in and of itself, may not be a particularly effective strategy, but in combination, in a, in, in a unit of study that's got some deep vocabulary work, that may work out well. So we call out context clues and teaching word parts, that's morphology, as two really crucial areas. The third being, of course, cognates. We know that there is not transfer from native language to second language without very explicit, rigorous instruction. It doesn't just necessarily happen. So all of this is about turning our students into word learners, understanding how language works, not just building up their language itself, but understanding how it works. So turning them uh, into word learners so that when they are reading independently and come across a word they don't know, they stand a shot. They've got some tools in their toolkit for learning that word. The second recommendation is about integrating oral and written language instruction into content area teaching. So not thinking necessarily just about English language development over here and science and social studies and math over here, but how do we infuse oral and written language instruction into those content area teaching uh, into that time? The level of evidence is strong. The studies are at the intermediate and middle school level, just one study pre-K to second grade, and again, conducted in classrooms with both English learners and native speakers. You'll see in the guide that we call out four key steps. Not surprisingly, a couple of them you'll see are very similar to the first recommendation, which is to say we're going to have to get kids talking more if they're going to work more with content and language and build up their um, English language and literacy skills. The first step is about using uh, instructional tools, such as short videos, visuals, and graphic organizers to anchor instruction and help students make sense of contact, content. The second is about the vocab instruction that we embed in that work. The third is about classroom talk, and the fourth is about writing instruction. So on the tools side of things, we've got graphic organizers as having very strong evidence when they are 
used in context, which is to say this is part of a unit of study. We're, we're looking uh, at the content. We're going to study the content over time. Starting with short videos, visuals, and graphic organizers can be a very good way to anchor instruction and help students make sense of content. The second is about the content-specific academic vocabulary and the general academic vocabulary. So again, just as we're trying to make distinction between code and meaning-based skills, we're also trying to have uh, educators think and have students thinking about the distinction between vocabulary that's content-specific and vocabulary that's general and academic and cuts across the curriculum. So you can see that we have some recommendations about how we go about that teaching. You can see here that uh, in steps three and four, there are real parallels to recommendation one, which is that step three is about daily opportunities for students to talk about content in pairs and groups. This is not to say we're looking to increase chatter. We're looking to increase structured opportunities to use language, to practice it uh, with each other with uh, routines and protocols that will help them uh, do that uh, productively. Often in short periods of time, right? So we're not looking for lengthy discussions. We're looking for short periods of time that are structured and targeted. And finally, the fourth step, not surprising, in content areas also, we're going to have to ratchet up our opportunities to provide um, writing in extended kinds of circumstances, which is to say the writing pieces are going to have to be projects that are worked on over time. There's going to have to be drafting and revising. We remind ourselves that what good writers do is spend a whole lot more time planning and thinking and talking about their writing than they do necessarily going right from pen to paper. So the idea here is that the written language becomes an extension of the other work and we plan our argument. We might have a graphic organizer. We might talk our partner through our argument. And it's three points long before we go right from pen to paper. That leads me into the third recommendation, where we actually had minimal evidence just based on the research, which the research on writing is, in general, pretty slim. There isn't a whole lot of research on writing. We also see in practice that we need to do a whole lot more extended writing. So this is a case where we took what we knew from the existing research and collective expertise and still went ahead and made the recommendation that we need regular structured opportunities to develop written language skills. So two studies, um, one included a writing component as part of the larger study of the impact on academic vocabulary. The other one was about uh, writing instruction and professional development. You can see here we end up with four steps. Uh, one about anchoring the writing in content, period. We're going to have to do much more work that anchors the written language production in content as opposed to strictly drawing on the personal and the opinion, which we tend to do to sort of link it to, to that more narrative approach to writing. Some of this is going to have to be about the content. That is where the concepts and the words are giving kids the most difficulty. I'll say more about step two in a minute. The third, not surprisingly, is we're going to ratchet up classroom talk for students to work and talk together on their writing. And finally, we're pushing for assessing students' writing periodically to identify their needs and provide positive, constructive feedback in response. We think about the writing as an ongoing kind of exercise. So step two, what I wanted to call out for you, and it's certainly in this handout, is the idea that there's going to have to be language-based supports to facilitate students' entry into and their continued development of writing. So you can see here that we've got you know, um, sentence stems and language frames and organizers that help as precursors to getting to that written product. And it's not to say that we work on these in isolation, but these are the precursors to getting to that, that written output. And, for those of you with a background in thinking about supporting strugglers, not surprisingly, this is really about breaking down that five-paragraph essay or whatever written product, product you're looking for, backing up, starting with the thinking part and the organizing part and the syntax part, having students work on those elements, and then come bring, bringing it all together in the form of one written product. 
So you can see that there's real, uh, there, there's a lot of like, sort of cross-cutting and, and interrelatedness across these three recommendations that we're thinking carefully about how to turn our classrooms into even stronger language learning environments, whether that's oral or written, in the service of promoting advanced literacy skills. And with that, we sort of shift more towards the content and the academic concepts and vocabulary that are giving students difficulty, and we give them more time to be productive with language, whether it's oral or written. Um, we build in the scaffolds and supports. We have the varied groupings, so there's nothing in the research that would suggest that if we are, if we are gonna build up language, oral and written, students are both gonna have to talk more and work together more with, at differing levels. So they're gonna have to be grouped, sort of mixed groupings. We're gonna need more explicit instruction on the meaning-based side of reading as we have done such a good job of on the code-based and we're gonna anchor it all in academic content. Mm -hmm.